You think life is going one way, and then you throw in a curveball, and the unexpected happens, and it catches you off guard, and everyone's surprised and says, where'd that come from? The person we're going to look at today, King David, in the book of 2 Samuel, has a lot of curveballs. There's a lot of unexpected twists and turns. There's a lot of highs and a lot of lows. There's a lot of things that take place that you don't see coming in the story. Stick with us, and we'll get into the details. Well, welcome back, and thanks for joining us once again as, we look, as we're looking through the Bible and seeing redemption at the heart of each and every book. Today, we are in 2 Samuel. Last time, we got to see 1 Samuel. We got to see the two kings appointed, good king, bad king. Saul wasn't the king. David was anointed king. We got to see David kind of live uh, a life up to the point of him being taken out of the uh, fields as a shepherd and thrust into this kingship. He Really, he was uh, kicking butt and taking names. Well, today, as we look at 2 Samuel, we're going to see what happens in David's life as he's king. Now, the book, from a detail standpoint, takes David from the time that he was placed on the throne as king to about the time that he dies. He's going to die in the first chapter of 1 Kings, which will be next week. So this is his kingship. Now, you may assume from 1 Samuel and everything that he did, David and Goliath and him making a name for himself, being a victorious king and winning, winning all these battles, that his kingship is going to be smooth sailing. What we're going to see today is that that's not necessarily the case. There's some really high points that we're going to look at, but we also have to contrast those with the really low points that we're going to see. Now, 2 Samuel is actually a very important book in the plan of redemption and the story of redemption. 2 Samuel advances the messianic hope that began in the garden, and it is a very clear picture of redemption as God is pushing it forward. Now, with this book, I, I, we are going to look at kind of a big picture approach and we'll talk about some of the stuff that goes on, but I want to really focus in on one particular chapter and one particular scene in David's life. And if you don't read any other section from 2 Samuel this week or ever, you must read chapter 7. Chapter 7 is a um, key chapter in the story of redemption because it focuses in on the Davidic covenant. Now we've seen covenants thus far in our study. We've seen the uh, the um, Adamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and these covenants are used to progress and push the unfolding mystery of redemption as it moves throughout the Bible. Well, the Davidic covenant is one more step, one step closer to Christ. All of those covenants are giving us a clear picture of the person coming and what he's going to do, Christ. Now, I want to focus in on chapter 7. And chapter 7 is that chapter that's looking at the Davidic covenant. We see God's promises towards David of what's happening. But I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but it, it is much of it. It's, it's really from verse 1 all the way to verse 17 of chapter 7 of 2 Samuel. So I want to get some context just so that we can jump in and read a couple of verses. David wants to build the Lord a house. And that word is very important house. He's looking at his house. He's in a house of cedar. He's in an established home. And he's looking at the tabernacle. He's looking at the Ark of the Covenant. He's looking at God's house, which is still a tent. And he's saying, listen, I dwell in a house. I want the Lord to dwell in a house. And so he goes to the prophet Nathan. And he says, listen, I want to build God a house, a temple, an established building. And the Lord turns it on its end. And he says, listen, I don't want you to build me a house. Rather, I'm going to build you a house. And it's the same Hebrew word here for house as in dwelling to house as in temple. And what the Lord says is, you're not going to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house, an eternal house, an eternal destiny, dynasty that is going to reign for eternity. And so I want to read just four verses, seven to 12, and look at the promises that God gave to David. And then, just to show my cards that even before I read these verses, I want to see how those promises are, for, are fulfilled by Christ. So this is 7, 12 through 16. It says this, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with, with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 
I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now to a king, those are blessed words. Because obviously a king, what they want to see is that their kingdom continuing. They want to see their son rise up and carry the throne and protect the throne and keep the kingdom safe. So the promises that God gives to David in this command covenant is that David's kingdom is going to be established, is going to be in existence forever, for eternity. These are blessed words. Now, can just consider the question that we've been tracing through this study all the way back in Genesis. Who is going to come to crush the head of Satan? And in these covenants, as the unfolding mystery has been brought forward through these covenants, that question of who is going to come has been focusing and has been becoming more particular. And so now with the Davidic covenant, we see that, okay, the person coming is going to be part of David's line. He is going to be a descendant of David. He is going to sit on David's throne, and it's going to be a throne that will be established forever. So we don't know who it is yet, but we know that it's, he's going to come through David. Well, if we can jump ahead in the Bible, we're just assuming we're going to know it. So now the question is, okay, is it Solomon, David's son? Well, what we're going to see as we, as we progress in the next couple of weeks, it's not going to be Solomon. He's a train wreck. Is it going to be Solomon's son? No, it's not going to be Solomon because Solomon's son because he's a train wreck. Is it going to be any other king? No, because all of those other kings are going to fail. So we're still asking the question, who's coming? Who is going to come to crush the head of Satan? Well, he's coming from David. Now, we know the answer to this. It's Christ. And hear how Christ was described in the New Testament in relation to the Davidic covenant that I just read. When Mary, when the angel came to Mary, this is Luke 1, 30 through 33, listen to the declaration, the testimony that this angel gave Mary. It said this, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your room and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Again, consider uh, 2 Samuel 7, 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be forever before me, and your throne shall be established forever. Consider Hebrews 1. Just consider how, how Hebrews starts out where, where God is saying, listen, Jesus is better than everyone who has come before him. And this is Hebrews 1, 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be my son. Consider the words of Second Samuel again. I will be to him a father, this is verse 14, and he shall be to me a son. It is very clear from, the, from 2 Samuel that whomever is coming is going to continue and sit on the throne of David. And it is going to be David's descendants that are going to come and crush the head of Satan. He's going to be the ultimate king. Now again, I said... You could consider all of the victories that David has had up to this point. This covenant comes early on in his ministry. So you could assume that it's going to be an amazing kingship. It's going to be an amazing time. It's going to be a struggle-free life. And then you look at David's time on the throne. And it's one of struggle. It's one of failure. It's one of pain. It's one where everyone is going, are you sure that that covenant is still going to stand? Are you sure that David was the right one? You see him banished from Jerusalem by his son. You see him commit adultery. The man after God's own heart commit adultery, commit murder with Bathsheba and with uh, Uriah. You see him keep fighting. It's not a peaceful kingship. It's not a peaceful lineage 
It's one that is, there is much pain and suffering. And yet, David's life continues to demonstrate for us that the person who's going to come and sit on that throne, it has to be more than a mere man because men are sinful and broken and it's not going to work out. And at the same time, David's life reminds us and demonstrates for us that the Lord uses weak, lowly, and foolish people to bring about His divine plan so that God gets the glory. David was used for God's eternal plan of salvation not because he was perfect or the ideal man from man's viewpoint, but rather because God was with him and God determined to use him. It's very easy in life for us to put these Old Testament characters on a pedestal and say, look, they have it all together. They were the right guys. We should follow their example. I, I would say much of David's life is not worth following, but his faith is worth following. And the reason that David was used by God, the reason that David can be put forward and say he's a good guy isn't because of what he did. It's because of what he believed. So King David is in Scripture pointing us to somebody greater than himself. He, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Israel at its height, had to look outside of himself and say, listen, somebody greater than I is coming who is going to make all things new, who is going to sit not on a temporal earthly throne, but on an eternal heavenly throne. Don't look to me, look to him. I hope you will enjoy reading this book this week. Again, if you don't read any other chapter, read 2 Samuel 7 and just see the faithfulness of the Lord to progress the story of redemption throughout the Bible. Um, with that, thanks for watching. and We'll catch you next week with the First Kings.